Less is more. This is true in a lot of areas, but perhaps none more than racing. You want to go faster? You want to spend less money? Break fewer parts? Pass more cars? Find everything on your race car that is not absolutely necessary and throw it away. If you do this, I mean really do this, all the way as far as you can, you will end up with a cart. Cart racing is motorsports distilled down to its core. There is no suspension, no differentials, no doors or roofs or bodies. There is nothing you don't need. You don't even need a driver's license. Anybody old enough to reach the pedals can do it. There is no other racing where you are so directly connected to the racetrack, so undeniably close to the action. Your shoulders are inches away from other drivers, your butt millimeters from the ground. Buckle up. And by buckle up, I mean don't buckle up because they don't have seatbelts. It is exhilarating and approachable and inexpensive, but somehow surprisingly complex. Kart racing is popular all over the world, but like all good things, it was invented in the United States. Art Ingalls welded together the first kart in 1958 using scrap metal and a spare two-stroke engine. Within a year, there were dozens of carts racing on the Rose Bowl parking lot, and within 10 years, the sport had spread around the world, from the west coast of California to East Berlin. It's called a kart because it has all the safety equipment of a shopping cart. That's not true. It's not entirely clear where the name cart came from or why it's spelled with a K instead of a C, but the safety equipment is quite limited. There are some carts with cages used on dirt tracks, but most carts are open. No doors, no roof, no seat belts. In a lot of ways, it's closer to motorcycle racing than car racing. You don't drive a cart. You ride a cart. There are three key attributes to a cart. One, no suspension. Two, no differential axle. And three, no rack and pinion steering. If you add any of those, you no longer have a cart. You have a car. Also, carts almost always have single-cylinder engines. There are some electric carts, but in racing series, they are almost always two- or four-stroke singles. There are two-cylinder super carts, and sometimes you'll see YouTubers or your cool uncle shove a leader bike engine into a cart. This seems like a good idea. More power equals more fun, but this is less adding power to a cart and more removing safety equipment from a race car. So, that's a cart. But how do you race carts? Where do you race carts? And what are the ins and outs of going fast in a cart? I found out the answers to these questions and others a few weeks ago when I went to the largest kart race in the country, Super Karts USA Super Nationals. I followed my friend Kyle. He and I raced Formula SAE in college. We were both fast drivers, but he was always a little bit faster than me. And since I am Super Fast Matt, we will henceforth refer to him as Ultra Fast Kyle. Karting is inexpensive, and to try to keep it inexpensive, most classes have pretty strict limits on what you can do to your engine. If you're looking for minimum fuss and minimum cost, look no further than the LO206 class, the Briggs & Stratton, the lawnmower engine. 9 horsepower, $600, sealed from the factory. Everyone gets the same power, and it's not very much. The other side of the spectrum is the shifter cart. I used to own a shifter cart. They are wild. They'll get up to around 50 horsepower, which doesn't seem like a lot, but that's only if you've never driven one. Carol Shelby once said there's no such thing as too much horsepower, and that's because Carol Shelby never drove a shifter cart. The engines are about 10 times as expensive as the Briggs and a lot more expensive to run. They have six-speed transmissions, radiators, clutches. Go all in and you're starting to move out of the affordability of cart racing. In the middle, we have this, a KA100 cart, air-cooled, two-stroke, one-speed, fast and inexpensive, but still surprisingly complex. These engines have specifications that limit your ability to crank out more than about 28 horsepower. Your muffler has to meet specific dimensional requirements, but if you buy three mufflers, you might find that one gives you a little more power. Spark plugs can only protrude into the combustion chamber so far, but if you buy 10 spark plugs, you might find that a few of them have thread orientations that clock the electrode in a way that gives better combustion. The engines are supposed to last for several hours, but they do start to lose a noticeable amount of power about halfway through their rated life. It's only a little bit, but when you have 28 horsepower, a fraction of a horsepower is a lot. The clutches are centrifugal, meaning you just press the go pedal and they engage. The clutch will get better with time, kind of. As it wears out, it will engage at a higher RPM, which is good, except there's a limit to this engine speed in the rules. You can tune the air-fuel ratio. You can actually do it while you're driving. There are two knobs on the side of the carburetor. This simplicity helps to limit the problems you might have, but they do still show up sometimes, as bent reed valves from overcooking your engine or air leaks in your carburetor. It is still auto racing after all.
Perhaps the most important part of the cart is the chassis. I said carts don't have suspension, but that's not actually true. The frame is the suspension, or rather the frame and the steering and the axle and the wheels and this bar up front here. Everything is a spring, and these frames are designed to spring in a specific way. Different manufacturers will use different tube sizes and alloys, giving them different characteristics. One of the key attributes of a cart is the solid rear axle. Both tires spin at the same rate. When you go around a corner, the outside tire travels farther, so it wants to spin more times. Cars fix this problem by using a differential. Carts don't have differentials. If they did, they'd be cars, and we wouldn't be talking about them here. Here's the problem. When you go around a corner, most of your weight shifts to the outside tire, so the axle spins as fast as that tire wants to rotate. The inside tire scrubs on the ground, doing a little burnout. But that burnout is adding torque through the axle to your outside tire. Your tires can grip in cornering or acceleration or a fraction of both. To go around corners the fastest, you want your outside tire at maximum grip, way out here. But when your inside tire is scrubbing on the ground, it adds torque to the axle, adding force to your outside tire, reducing the cornering force, and reducing your cornering speed. It also drops the RPM since the inside tire traction wants to slow down the engine. If you can leave the corner without dragging the inside tire, the engine is spinning faster and has more power to accelerate you into the straightaway. But if you drag that tire, the engine bogs and you're not only slower through the corner, but also the next part of the track. You need to get that inside tire off the ground, but not way off the ground. When you lift the inside tire too much, your outside tire starts to roll onto its sidewall. You lose your contact patch, you lose grip, and the inside tire comes back down. Sometimes it will do this over and over, bouncing the inside tire. A bumpy track makes it much harder to keep the tire from bouncing. What you want to do is just barely get that tire off the ground and hold it up through the corner. Some of the best kart racers do this imperceptibly, getting all the load off that tire without actually lifting it visibly off the ground. There are several ways to tune your chassis to accomplish this. The steering has caster. When you steer to the right, the right wheel rotates back, but it also moves down a little bit. The wheel on the left moves up. This will want to rotate the whole vehicle, lifting up that inside rear tire. Your car does this too. You just don't notice it because it's much bigger and you have suspension. The caster is adjustable, so you can tune how much it lifts the rear tire for a given corner. The bar up front will stiffen the front of the cart. This adds stability in cornering and braking. It can also sort of amplify the effects of the caster by making the chassis stiffer. Generally, the stiffer the bar, the more front grip you get, but too much will over-stiffen the front, causing the tire to overload quickly, and you might make the rear inside tire lift too quickly or too much. On a course with tight corners, you'll want a stiffer bar, but on the bigger corners, a stiff bar might make your back end slide around, scrubbing off all your speed and nullifying the benefits of all that front grip. Some of this stuff will affect corner entry or exit differently than it does the middle of the corner. Changing your caster will sometimes give you more bite on corner entry at the expense of maximum cornering grip. This might make the cart feel faster through a corner when in reality it's actually slower. All of these changes will affect all of the other changes and how the cart reacts in all sorts of situations. So fixing one corner might screw it up for the rest of them. This is a kind of art and most series limit data acquisition in a cost reduction effort which gives an advantage to the people who have been doing it long enough to build an intuition around it. When you don't have very much horsepower, it's important to make sure it all gets to the pavement, so spend some money on bearings and make sure they're lined up. Some of these teams will also run a new chain every time or clean them in ultrasonic cleaners after each heat to get all the muck out. The tires act somewhat differently than you might expect. A lot of time you'll want to add pressure to get more grip. Lap times get noticeably better between the first and third laps because the tires need to get heat in them to turn them on. The axle is also part of the suspension. It's a hollow tube with grooves for the brakes, the sprocket, and the wheels, but it does more than transmit torque. You can get them in several different stiffnesses. A softer bar will flex in the middle, changing the outside tire contact patch with a lifted inside tire. But it also flexes on braking and acceleration, so you get more stability in braking with a stiffer axle, and a more powerful cart will generally need a stiffer axle. The wheels also affect the setup. You can get them in cast or forged, giving you more or less flex from your wheel. The forged wheel will also change the air volume inside the tire, allowing for a shape that maintains a target stiffness while reducing air volume. This reduces the air pressure change as the tire heats up. Most of the stuff will not only change how much the tire wants to lift, but how quickly it does it, and also what happens in braking and acceleration. A lot of these changes are counterintuitive, especially if you've spent some time tuning vehicles with suspension. You can't just be good at race cars. You have to be good at carts. It's said that a good setup will be about two to three tenths of a second faster than the standard setup, but a bad one could be much worse. So make sure you know what you're doing. 
In most auto racing, you control the car with the pedals and the steering wheel, but in kart racing, you control the vehicle with your entire body. Not only does the driver have to be good at finding the right lines and adjusting to the changing tire and track conditions, but also your posture has a significant effect on your performance. In the straightaways, you can see the drivers hunching over to reduce their aerodynamic drag. The other ways are a little more subtle. On some of the carts, you can see the braces going from the top of the seat down to the corner of the frame. Maybe you have a soft setup for some corners, but in others you want to get your weight on that outside tire. How you lean or don't lean into the corners affects how the chassis reacts and flexes. You can change where the seat struts mount, and you can remove it entirely. In fact, as racing progressed, we started to see more and more drivers without this brace in their carts. The driver can also push on the heel plates below the pedals. Pushing on the inside plate might make the chassis flex more, while pushing on the outside might make everything a little more rigid. Getting the inside tire off the ground is the job of the cart, but keeping it off the ground, holding it in the air, is the job of the driver. The best drivers are changing their positions in every corner and changing it throughout the race. Remember how I said the setup changes from course to course and day to day? Well, it also changes throughout the same race. Rubber gets laid down, dirt gets swept around. Even beyond the tires warming up, sometimes the course physically changes. Carts will slide into barriers and course workers will place them differently or sometimes can't even get them reset, changing the racing line outside a corner between one lap and the next. Karting is dynamic. At the end of the week, ultra-fast Kyle finished mid-pack. The problems with the reed valve and the leaking carburetor hose put him in a bad qualifying spot. He did well to move up in the final race, but someone decided to drive him into the wall. It might have gone better, but that is racing. Everyone but the person in first place has all the what-ifs. It is what it is, and ultra-fast Kyle has been demoted to not ultra-fast, but still pretty fast Kyle. If less is more, and it is, then maybe the least is the most. And the least is a 200 pound sled with one piston and one brake. Karting is engaging in a way that no other racing is. The wheel to wheel and shoulder to shoulder racing is exciting and kind of dangerous. Less so than it seems, but still, you are exposed. There are wrecks, a lot of them. Most of the time it's just bruised ribs and bruised egos. Lots of bruised egos. Karting can get really competitive. There are some classes that are filled with people who all think they're going to be the next Max Verstappen, and the only thing between them and a professional career in auto racing is you. There are a lot of rules, and the difference between first and second place is sometimes how close you can get to the limit of those rules. The front bumpers are fitted with brackets that will pop back if you hit someone too hard from behind. A bumper mount in this position comes with a penalty. This had to be added because people figured out the best way to pass the guy in front of you is to just punt him into the wall. Some racers drilled holes in the bottom of their bumpers to make them less stiff and therefore less likely to get pushed back when they ram someone, so they had to add a rule against drilling holes in your front bumper. It's competitive. All racing is. It's just an arbitrary set of rules so we can compete and see who is the best at something. There is a trend in life to move towards things that are bigger, faster, more expensive, and more complicated. Part of it is that we grow out of the simpler things, but the truth is that most people do it because that's what we're supposed to do. Racing is really expensive, but if you want a great challenge and a lot of fun, you can do it with carts for a lot less money. And I don't mean fun per dollar or fun per cubic centimeter. I mean fun. The total sum of fun in a weekend of karting is almost certainly more than a weekend of Porsche Cup. The racing is closer, the ground is closer, you feel the speed in a way that you can't in an enclosed car, the boring parts are easier, the fun parts are more fun, and you're on the track more often with more people, all having a great time. If you want to get into racing, karting is a good place to start, and maybe a good place to just stay. <laughs>